So when I was asked uh, by Ben to come speak about branding, my first uh, response was, why? Like, I actually don't know anything about branding. I really, really don't. I'm not, I, I don't have a marketing degree. Uh, if you want to just like pull out your cell phone and play for half an hour or 25 minutes, that, that's fine. Uh, everything that I've learned was hands-on. Uh, and I don't know how to define what a brand is. I, don't, I actually don't know what it is. And I sat down and I tried to do it. And I was going to start off with a technical academic definition of what a brand is and the five Ps because I've read these books and I know what a brand is supposed to be. But I couldn't come up with something that's really, really compelling. Um, one definition of it, and I'm sure everybody has read this, uh, or has at least heard people talk about it, is this amazing Supreme Court ruling about obscenity uh, in, in presented material. And it's this entire court case about pornography, porn. Uh, and, and one of the, the judges, and this is one of the most cited Supreme Court cases, is basically, I don't know how to define porn, but I know it when I see it. But when I look at it, I know exactly what it is. And I think that every single person in this room, whether you can define a brand or not define a brand, I think when you look at a brand, you know what it is. Right? And you know, when you look at something, if that's off-brand, hey, why is Coca-Cola showing me a picture of Shrek? Right? You'd never see that. And you know when something is on-brand, hey, the new Microsoft, not the old Microsoft that we grew up with, but the new Microsoft, is doing this really edgy commercial with a guy named Mac Book. Right? And, and you define these brands, and you don't know exactly what it is, but when you look at something, you say, holy crap, those guys just nailed their brand. And it happens that every single company that knows what they're doing, and I don't think this is, there's a brand strategist, and I'm sorry for all brand strategists that are here, I don't think there's a brand strategist that's responsible for this. I think there's an intuitive, ground-up understanding of, hey, this is what our brand is, and this is how we reflect it. And the people that consume that brand, and the people that interact with the brand, when they see it, they know it, and they might not be able to explain it, but over the long run, when they keep on interacting with those different points, they slowly pick it up. And it's not just about words. What I have over here, and probably nobody can read this, is a list of the different Coca-Cola taglines that have existed since 1886. Okay? Coca-Cola has flipped their tagline very, very often. So when I think of Coca-Cola, I think of this. I guess this dates me, right? I think enjoy, and Coca-Cola always the real thing. There's this crazy one, which would not fly today, and I think people's Israelis would be freaked out. Coca-Cola, 1925, six million a day, which at this point is a little awkward, but there's been a lot of different taglines that have gone on in Coca-Cola. And we know that, that that tagline is not what makes the brand, but we also know that if you see red and white, you're either going to think Santa or you're going to think Coca-Cola. And that's what a brand is. It's not a stupid word. It's not a stupid tagline. It is the full manifestation of everything that you put together. And when I thought about it, I was like, hey, wait a minute. I have a really good analogy. And people in presentations really like analogies. If you ask the product team to put together planet Earth, they put together continents, they put together oceans, they put together cities, they put together a ton of things. And one thing that they might forget is they might forget to put together an atmosphere. Right? Everything that we breathe, all the air that we use. Like this whole little circle, a very, very thin layer around it. And then when you ask the product person, they probably say, it's OK. People will wear helmets. Right? They'll breathe. They'll have to take. It's OK. It'll be functional. But at the end of the day, what a brand actually is, it's a very, very thin layer. It's a very thin layer that sits on top of every single thing that we do. Certainly not the tagline. We just talked about that. Certainly not the logo. Ron talked about the Slack logo. Right? It's certainly not one visualization, because every single company changes their visualizations. Look at Uber's branding over the past five years. Incredibly strong brand, and they flip-flopped three times in the past 10 years. Every time a new CMO joins a Silicon Valley company, the first thing they'll do is, ah, this brand sucks. We've got to redefine their brand. And they'll redefine their brand, but there is something in the DNA of every single company that persists. So yeah, I can't define a brand, but what I can say, it is a thin little layer, the thin little sheen on top of planet Earth that defines every single thing that you interact with and everything that you, that you deal with. And as I said, I don't know brand from any like, academia. All I know is my own experiences. So I'm really, really good at cookie batter. I love making cookie batter, mostly because I like to eat cookie batter. I'm good at marketing, and I'm good at achieving brand awareness. I really know the 1996 Chicago Cubs, at which point they stopped following baseball. The things I don't know are brand colors and calculus, but what I do know about a brand, and every single company, and this is something that I screwed up time and time again, when I first started at the company that I work at, is that if you have a brand 
that is reflected in a style guide, but every single person at your company does not know what that brand is, you don't have a brand. Every single person at Coca-Cola knows that red and white. Every single person breathes it. If you work at Slack, every single person there will know that they're the anti-email. If you work at Salesforce, every single person knows that they are no software. And that goes much deeper than the stupid animations that they use at Dreamforce. It goes to something that's in the DNA of the company. And what I also know, because I do know math, and I do know statistics, I know that when you have a good brand, there's an ROI aspect. There's money in it. And the reason I know it is because our CEO, who's an amazing guy, hates branding and he hates fluff. But we have kept on investing in it, and we've kept on putting money into building what our brand is. Not in Israel. Nobody in Israel knows what our company does, but that's okay because we don't target Israel at all. Uh, we have invested in brand time and time again because we can prove that there is strong ROI when we invest in it. So what today I'm going to do, instead of talking about the academic uh, underpinnings of brand, what I'm going to talk about is three uh, very brief case studies at three different points in our company's life cycle. Uh, the first one is how you can use constraints to actually shape a brand. Right? Because you don't define a brand by yourself. If a brand defines everything between where you engage with your customer, your customer needs to play an active role in defining that brand as well. Right? Because it's not just about you. It's not you talking about yourself. The second thing I want to talk about is how you implement the brand when you go after very specific B2B niches. And the third thing I want to talk about is how you actually implement that brand when you start to scale up a little bit. Uh, but first, uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Eitan Buckman. Uh, I'm the chief marketing officer at a company called Fredos. Nobody knows us because we're based in Jerusalem, which is weird, right? Um, uh, we are basically an Expedia for international freight for companies that import or export goods. We help you instantly compare prices, book shipments, and manage your shipments. Thank you for not falling asleep while I said that. Yes. Um, my job is to make freight sexy, which is kind of what you'd expect from somebody who looks like that when they're six years old. Uh, I also host a marketing podcast called Marketers in Capes because there's only so much freight you can talk about. Uh, in order to understand this, I do need to talk for 30 seconds about international shipping and freight, just to understand the general context. Yes, I'm glad you asked. This is a picture that I drew of a container ship when my three-year-old daughter was homesick. So thank you very much. I'm quite talented at watercolor pictures on container ships. Uh, what Freightus actually does, beyond this Expedia for freight, right? you're an importer, you want to ship something, you compare prices, you book it, you manage it, is that we also create very, very, very sophisticated technology for very large freight companies, the companies that move everything. right? So my shoes were made in Vietnam, and this was probably made in China, and nothing here was made in Israel, probably. But everything comes from somewhere, and everything needs to be imported. right? So if you think about SIM, right? we all know SIM, or you think about United Airlines, don't think about LL. They don't deserve that. But if you think about any other airline out there, or you think about trucking companies, those are all things that need to move goods. And between the companies that move goods, the ocean liners and the airlines, and the people that need to move goods, the companies, there's a company called the Freight Forwarder. They're like a travel agent for international freight. And what Freightus does, beyond just creating this marketplace for booking and managing shipments, is we sell software to large freight companies. The companies that move everything in the world, but we don't know about it because, frankly, we don't give a shit. Right? As long as it comes and shows up on our doorstep or shows up in the uh, rack at a supermarket, we're pretty happy. So what we had to do when we first got started is we needed to go to very, very large technology, very large freight companies, the biggest in the world, D.B. Schenker and Kuninago, and companies that you don't know but that move half of the world. We had to go to them and say, hey, we're a small startup. Use our software. And they don't like that at all. And that's what shaped our brand. When we try to sell, we go to these very grumpy old men. And they sit in their boardrooms, and they say, hello, because they're all based in Germany. And we say, hello, uh, what can you do for us? And we'd say, OK, well, we make technology for freight companies. We're a very, very sexy startup. And we automate international freight. And we can make your life better. And they'll say, we don't believe you, because we are very good at what we do. And you guys are a startup. And we don't trust you. And that was it. We got shut down. Because the way that we were trying to sell to them and the way that we tried to get in the door is, hey, we're really cool. Innovation, technology, yay. And the way they were thinking is, no. And that ended it. So what we had to do was try to figure out a better way to get in there. And it all started with, for me when I went to uh, a, a show in Dublin. Um, the name is escaping. They tried to be like the CES of Dublin. I'm sure somebody here remembers the name of this crappy 
whatever. Some of you will remember it. Um, this very, very large show that was absolutely atrocious. It was the worst trade show I've ever been to. It was sold as this amazing technology conference. We went there. We got nothing out of it. Uh, all we did, and you can't really see it with these monitors, but what we're looking at in the background is a picture of sheep that were tie-dyed pink and yellow. So you got to feel bad for the sheep. And at a certain point, I was standing at this tiny little booth. You know when you're like a little like uh, poor startup and you have like fifty dollars, and they say, "Hey, you get a turnkey booth for only a thousand dollars," and you say, "Amazing!" and you show up, and it's literally just like a table like this, and you just stand next to it, and nobody stops at you. So that's what the show was. And we waited for people to come and talk to us, and nobody talked to us. So I went back to the hotel room, and I just sat down, and I started to write. And I started to write by thinking about who is our actual target audience. Our actual target audience are these people, the grumpy old men. And we need to convince them that Freightos knows what we're doing. And you guys can automate your freight shipping processes, not because we're a sexy innovation company or a sexy, a sexy technology company, but because we actually understand what you do. And what I ended up doing in this marathon writing session uh, was coming out with this very long research paper where I made up a freight company and I tried to get freight quotes, like pricing, from the top 20 freight companies in the world and I wrote up this like 20 page report about it while I was stuck in this like very like, romantic hotel in the middle of Dublin. And what ended up happening there, and I got very lucky that this trade show was so bad, is that I think I started to shape the Freighters brand. And I did it totally accidentally and this is why I'm saying this was not a conscious decision. What I realized at that point was the people that we're going after, these large logistics companies, the experience that they need to get from a company like ours is not sexy. It's not polished. What they need to understand is that Fredos gets it. They were not coming and saying, you're doing it all wrong, we could do it better. It's, hey, you've done an amazing job so far. How could we help you? And hey, I've helped identify these three, four, five things that you guys are doing wrong and that we think you can approve can you let us enter the room together with you, and together we'll explore a better future? And it worked like crazy. And that, and that ended up crystallizing for us. When we work with these huge B2B companies, these multinational companies that have billion dollars worth of goods uh, that they're importing around the world every single quarter, is that our brand needs to be an average between us and them. And our brand needs to be something that says, hey, we get logistics technology. This is our area of expertise. Let's not talk about what freighters can do. Let's not talk about what your problems are. Let's talk about logistics technology. And for four years, that became our full brand. Every single thing that we tried to do is how can we be the expert for logistics technology? Most of the things that we put together, the content we put together, these long reports that we put together, would not even mention what our product does. It was all an attempt to get in the door so that they look at us and they say, holy crap, those guys are experts. We tried to build ourselves as a McKinsey or a Gardner for international freight which gets a little boring. But the way that was actually reflected, the real tangible manifestations of that, is every single month putting together an email newsletter of every single thing that happens in the logistics technology sector. And if our biggest competitor raised a huge round, of course we'd put it in there. Because this is not about us versus them, it's about what is happening in the industry so that we have that expertise. We'd put together quarterly logistics technology summaries when people would download we'd send our content, we'd send them surveys, and we'd use that as a flywheel to keep on getting more information from them. And slowly, we gained the respect of the industry. And the brand of Fredos for them started to reflect brand expertise. It started to reflect, this is what people actually get. These people actually understand what they're talking about. I think the peak of that, uh, and I know that AppsFlyer crushes it when it comes to doing events. For us, the peak of our brand expertise is that we stopped going to trade shows, besides when we were invited to speak about our research. Instead, what we ended up investing in, once a year we put together one show that is invite only. We only invite about 50 to 60 people to come to the show, and we make them pay for it. And we ask C-levels from the top 100 companies in our space to come out, and they come. So C-levels from Maersk, which moves 20% of, of, the, of the world's goods. C-levels from the top airlines in the world, from SAP, from Salesforce, from huge companies, accept our invitation because they know that we're not going to sell to them because they know that what the Freightos brand represents is expertise. They fly out to us. Last year when we ran Freight Tech in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, we had people that flew out from Korea, we had people that flew out from Japan, and every single one of them pulled out their credit card and paid in order to join and in order to benefit from our expertise. And we did not talk about one product of ours at that trade show. And I think that, for me, was at least the very beginning of what a brand is. But ROI is really important too, right? We're not running a consulting company. I wasn't there in order to replace McKinsey and Gartner, we actually had things to sell. 
And the way that their ROI is reflected is actually in hardcore publications. Economists writing articles that include our stuff. There are three White House committees over the past three years that took Freo's research and ended up using our research in order to talk about fake digitization. And every single time those are published, people reach out to us and say, hey, we understand you're digitizing freight. I don't know what that means. But we'd like to hear what it is that you actually do. And those turn into real leads and those turn into real prospects because they come to you and they understand that you're an expert. It turned into mentions in the Wall Street Journal, which I think are totally useless unless they turn into leads and deals. But they did. They turned into leads and deals and they turned into workshops because our brand ended up becoming a brand that was fully focused on how can I help the customer be better at what they do and how can I project that expertise. And then it started to go one step further. Because you have to look at, fine, you now have that brand, you have that expertise, people know what you're talking about, but you need to start pushing that brand out a little bit more. And you need to get a little bit more in people's faces, and yes, you need to start selling a little bit more. So what we ended up needing to do was we needed to explain what it is that Fedos does for every single one of these logistics companies. Right? If we're going after UPS, or we're going after FedEx, or we're going after United Airlines, we needed to get in front of the right people, and we needed to tell them, hey, this is exactly what Fredos does. And the way to do that is really complicated, and I'll show you this a little bit later on. We right now have about seven different products that go after 12 different target audiences. We're a 230 person company, we've raised about $95 million, but an 11 person marketing team really, really struggles to put that many products in front of that many different target audiences. So what we needed to do is we needed to come up with very, very specific filters at the very top and only get ourselves in front of the exact right people and be crystal clear about how we communicate what our brand is. Right? We already established this brand of expertise, these guys that get logistics technology, and then we have to figure out how do I get it in front of the exact right person. So the way we started going back to the drawing board when it came to that expertise, this research that we already did, was trying to figure out in the Venn diagram, where does our brand level expertise, right? We're talking about logistics technology. So where does the things that we know about logistics technology actually start to overlap with buy intent? With what, the, what our potential customers are actually going to buy? And we started to slowly move our brand away from logistics technology as a whole to start talking a little bit more about things that are slightly closer to our buy intent areas. We're starting to talk a little bit more about the things that we really know and the things that we can sell. And the first area, and I think one of the best examples of how we managed to do this, is starting to think about the content in terms of people that live in fear of competitors. When you look at the really, really large companies, right, the C-levels at Fortune 500 companies, the things that they wonder about the most, the things that they're concerned about the most is their competitors. Right? They don't really care what's happening internally at the company. If you're a publicly traded company, all you really care about is, hey, I'm running innovation here, what if my number one competitor does something else? And that's what they wake up every single morning and think about. And if your brand is, I'm going to empower you to help you beat your competitors, then that's something really powerful to do. So we ended up taking that report that we put together, and I talked about in the, uh, in the uh, previous uh, section, about here's how well the top 20 companies in the world are selling online. And we started pushing it in front of them. This was data we were already collecting. We started to do this, as I said, back in 2014. And we started to push it in front of these C levels. And again, it's the same general brand, and people download it, and people email us, uh, I think from a marketing perspective, when you have your VP sales reach out to you and say, hey, I spoke to this top five airline, and they want to know when your next report is coming out about X, Y, or Z, that's your success. Right? When they're actually coming to you and say, hey, I need your content. Right? And that's what we ended up building. We ended up building this expertise in a very specific area. When I sit down at a meal on, over the weekend with a friend and I say that, I, hey, I work at Fredo's, they have no clue what they're talking about. Nobody here knows what Fredo's is because you guys are not part of our target audience. But our target audience and every single person there understands what our brand is and understands that it, that it represents logistics technology. So people flock towards this. And the people that don't know about it, we shove it in front of their faces. So every year when we publish this report, and we're publishing this report again uh, tomorrow, our, our 2021, uh, uh, every single time we do it, we first send pre-releases to the people that have taken part in the surveys in the past. We pre-pitch every single journalist. We send it to the company, to the social managers at the target companies we're trying to reach. Right? So if you work at United Airlines and you did well in the survey, we'll send the social media manager at United Airlines the report. We'll talk about it from the rooftops, and then we'll start using LinkedIn lead forms to push it in front of very, very small target audiences, usually 2,000 to 3,000 people. And what we end up walking away with is exactly the right leads. Over the past six months, and again, very, very small target audiences, 
We've picked up 121 leads from C-levels at the exact companies we're trying to reach using our content with content that they really trust because they know our brand at an average cost of $55 per lead. And what that means for me effectively is that I can stop going to trade shows. Because there's no way that I'm going to get C-level leads from the right companies at $55 per lead. More importantly, and I mentioned before, you reach out to the social media managers in order to get in front of them. Mayor's going to have that annoyed. The two largest ocean liners in the world took our report and tweeted it or shared it on LinkedIn. And the reason they do that is because we cultivated a brand that talked about expertise and did not talk about us. And that is the only reason that companies there actually accept the fact that they can share our content. Because it's not like sharing a report from a technology provider. It's like sharing a report from Gartley or the Journal of Commerce or Wall Street Journal. As I said, head to head with our event budget, it crushed. Just these LinkedIn stuff alone ended up totally retracting our event budget. We took $250,000 that we were spending every single year and we stopped spending it. And we just shifted that spend totally over to LinkedIn because we have found better ways to build that brand that constantly got in front of the exact right people. And that's where things got a little bit tricky. And this is the last section. Because we did a very good job at selling our technology to these very large logistics companies. And I think that there's something that's kind of easy when it comes to B2B when you're going after such small audiences. But when you start going after very, very large audiences, right, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of people, that's when things get a little bit more tricky. And when we launched our online marketplace in 2016, we basically started targeting every single business that imports around the world. And there's a lot of them. And things started to fall apart here a little bit. Right? Because our general message and what we tried to project small and mid-sized businesses, and we have about 150,000 businesses on our platform right now. What we tried to project is that we make freight smooth. We make your entire importing process very frictionless and very, very easy. And that's something that we believe in very strongly. And our messaging, our design, the colors, everything that we use, we used to have these very heavy colors because in these old B2B industries, people like to present this like very bold and like noble and like heavy imagery. And what we wanted to say is, hey, we make this easier. This doesn't need to suck. And I think Apple dropped the total bomb in the room when they launched the iPhone in 2007. Suddenly, every B2B uh, application looked up and said, hey, I don't need to look like crap. I can stop having this blue screen of death that the travel agent, the, the people at the uh, travel desks are still stuck using. I can actually make my application look like what a consumer wants to look like. So we tried to embrace that. And we said, OK, if everything is smooth, our whole page needs to look smooth too. And our color scheme needs to shift away from this very, very heavy idea and shift to something that's smooth and elegant and very, very clean. And what we need to do, because we believe very strongly in these values of everything that's smooth and just easy, we need to drive pure value. And how do we drive value? It's not just about the colors and it's not just about the logos. And we talked about this before. If you think that a logo is just about your font selection and your color selection, you're totally wrong. Google is a crappy name. Right? And there's a million logos that are out there that are really crappy logos. A brand is much more than that. So we said, OK, our DNA will be we're going to make your life much easier. So we build website tools. We take a lot of the data that we create, and we build website tools, and we put it out for free online to try to make website, to, to try to make freight, to have freight easier. We invest a ton in education. My entire content team are not people that write for Google. They don't write for SEO purposes. They write articles that they hope will drive actual value. Every single person that comes to Fredos, whether you're a customer or not, can get free support from us if they have questions about international importing. And we take our data and we just let it go. There's free data indexes that we put out online that companies right now charge tens of thousands of dollars to put out. And we put it out for free, A, because it's an amazing marketing tool, but B, because we're very strong believers in the fact that everything should be smooth. But internally at the company, if you try to take a salesperson and you sit down and say, hey, guy, our brand is smooth. When he gets on the phone with somebody, he'll say, hey, do you want to buy something? Right? Because that's not how you roll out a brand. And it's really, really difficult to get an entire internal company or an internal organization on board with a brand philosophy that marketers write down. And I think every single person here that's ever put together a brand has struggled with the fact that they can wordsmith it. Right? You can spend an hour or you can spend a day writing a very, very tight presentation. Or you can spend six months in a coalition with 20 other marketers putting together a really tight deck. But when you try to get the sales team on board with it, they totally ignore you. So for example, you get stuff like this. Even our marketing team doesn't get this. Last week, everybody was talking about the bananas that were taped onto stuff. So we're like, hey, we'll get on board with that, right? We'll take a banana onto a container, and we'll say that's how you increase container prices. So somebody on our team put that together. And then we asked our Slack channel, hey, is this good? So I said, hey, amazing organic day yesterday. I'm just that's a little humble brag I'm dropping here. How do we feel about writing internet memes, banana, and I shared their thing. 
And then people started arguing. This is within our marketing team. The people that understand our brand and understand that we're supposed to reflect smooth and understand all these things. Everybody started this long debate, and this was the first, like the very, very beginning of a Slack chat that probably could have taken down Google's servers in terms of like hosting it. This went on for hours about should we actually put this banana up? Is the banana picture on brand? And it became one of the great debates of 2019. Because even internally within our marketing team, you could talk about a smooth brand that nobody actually understood. And nobody actually got it. And as you could tell from when this happened, this is not like something that happened us a year ago. Right now, today, we still don't know how to roll out a brand effectively so that every single person understands exactly what it does. It happens in other places too. Before I talk about how we build a lot of free tools to help drive value to people that visit our website, about two months ago, one of our most successful tools, this estimator to get a freight quote, which usually converts about 3% of the people that come to our website and we get a ton of traffic from it, broke. So usually what happens is people can put in where they're shipping stuff from and they get an instant estimate and if they want to come continue to Fredos and book, they can sign up and continue and book it. So that's how the calculator works. It's a great organic tool. It works really, really well. At a certain point, two months ago, it just stopped working. And nobody noticed because we're marketers, we're not developers, we don't run solid QA processes, we're idiots, whatever it is, we missed it. What we did see a week later is that our conversions to users signing up spiked. And what ended up happening was every single time somebody requested to get an estimate on the stupid calculator that we put together, instead of actually showing the answer, it said, hey, you need to sign up in order to see the answer. I.e., we started to gate content that we used to provide for free based on our underlying value of making your life much easier. And this was a, uh, a, a historical internal debate do we need to be smooth and stay true to our brand values? Or do we need to optimize around revenue? And it's still something that we're struggling with today. And it's not just in the marketing team. As I said, every single person within Fredos struggles with how we roll out a brand because we're at a very awkward teenage phase of our company where we're 230 people, but we don't know 250 people. We don't know how to actually successfully roll out a brand across everybody. And that's a struggle that we're continuing to deal with today. But the one thing that I do know, and this is a great quote, I'm, I'd like to feel very educated by sharing quotes from people that are much smarter than myself, is that in order to actually say something correctly, you need to understand it yourself. And what I would say is anybody that is trying to successfully implement a brand, if you understand your brand, if you understand what you stand for, is it smooth, is it easy, is it noble, is it challenger positioning, whatever that positioning is, how well do you understand it? And if you sit down with your VP sales, can you actually communicate what that means? And that is our number one challenge today, and that's a struggle that we're continuing with. Right? I wish I could come up with a million videos that show how we crack the code, but we haven't cracked it. What we have figured out is that we need to understand what our brand is before we start talking about it. We need to figure out what is it that we do, and then we need to explain it to other people. So we're investing very, very heavily in this. We're putting together this Soviet-style propaganda around, hey, internally within the company, Guys, you need to understand we have a bajillion products, and these are all the target audiences, and taking these posters, which look like a horror because we have way too many products. But we are starting to educate every single person within the company, hey, this is what we do, and this is where you fit inside the puzzle. But more than that, the way we actually talk matters. And we had to condense this very, very long style guide into four ideas that we feel like we really, really can communicate and that we deserve to communicate about it. We talk with the sales team. When you go on a phone call with an inside sales, with an inbound lead, what do you talk, what do you say? Hello, welcome to Fredo's? Is that what we talk about? Or hey, guy, what's going on? What is the actual brand if you're trying to communicate human and straightforward? Right? And trying to defluff it as much as possible, and this is a huge struggle for marketers, right? how can you stop the market and speak for a second and actually say concretely, our brand is smooth. Our brand is easy. Our brand is strong. And the way we reflect it is A, B, C, and D. And I think the number one test, as I would think about it now, is the banana test. But you look at a picture of a banana, or you look at a picture of anything that you're not sure, do I put this up, or do I put, uh, do I put it down? And you put it through that filter. Does it answer criteria A, B, C, and D? And if it does, and if even the salesperson on your team, or a developer on your team understands it, then it passed the test. The way that I think you actually really start to see this, and I promise I talk about ROI, the way you really start to see it when you implement the brand correctly uh, is that your users start to parrot it back to you. And for me, our tagline, we say Fredo's smooth shipping. 
Hello tagline is all about smooth and making life easier. And when you look through Trustpilot, and these are things from the past month or so, you start seeing this, the smoothest shipment I've ever had, smoothest shipping experience. These guys are miracle workers. Every shipment is coming in and out smoothly. And smooth is a weird word, especially when I say it five times in a row and I feel like I'm drunk. Um, as soon as you hear that word and you see that people keep on talking about smooth, you understand that you're doing something right. And it's not just internal understanding. Your users understand it as well. And we look at the referral emails that people send to their friends and they use the word smooth and we understand that that can't just come from marketing. It's not just the H1 on a, on a website because nobody really reads those. It's the way that the salespeople are talking and the way that the support people are talking and the way that every single person understands it. And as soon as we manage to say they get smooth and they think smooth, that's where these things start to really uh, uh, pop up from. So the main things that I would just like ask you to walk away from, A, brand is so much more than just colors and logos. I think the Hebrew thing that when we worked with an agency, they said that the last thing that you want is logo cheap salad. Right? You don't want just that stupid idea of like, this is what it is. Right? It's not a $5 logo online. It's what do you actually stand for? And not a fluffy mission statement, but what do you actually stand for? And when you, get, and when you sit down and you talk with your CEO and you say, I want to roll out this brand voice, not him just saying, sure, do whatever you want to do, marketing will do marketing, right? But actually it says like, no, my core belief is confidence, or my core belief is something else, and this is how we implement it. The second thing is make sure that you have a summary of how you engage, right? That brand voice needs to be the atmosphere. It needs to be every single aspect of how you deal with people. And the three thing is that brands need to convert into actual leads. If you build an amazing brand, but you can't use that brand in order to close deals, then you're dead. Uh, um, brand clarity, if you don't understand your actual underlying brand, then nobody will. So make sure that you sit down with yourself and you push yourself really hard to understand that. And that before your brand can start driving the ROI, you actually proceed with that brand education internally. And we've tried to roll out brands a couple of times. The only time it really, really works is when you manage to educate every single person and you turn that into part of the onboarding process. Right? You get involved. When somebody joins your company, you sit down and say, hey, welcome to Fredo's. Here's what our brand is and here's why that matters. Uh, that's it. My deck, this deck is, is not particularly amazing, but uh, I'll put it up on, on my website at buckman.co.il. Uh, as uh, Ben said, I, I have a podcast called Marketers and Capes. I've interviewed some very good companies, but the best interview is coming out next week with Ron from Housewire. I'm very excited about that. Um, but thanks very much for listening to me in English. I appreciate it.